Good afternoon. Uh, we have a bit more time than, than expected, which is good, because we'll be talking about one of the most important topics in Risk Five this year, uh, which is Risk Five in AI. How we are addressing the challenge of um, retargeting, addressing the market. You've heard Costa before how Risk Five has actually grown out of custom accelerators. Uh, and how Risk Five is becoming one of the technologies of choice if you're addressing the AI market. Um, for all of those who know me, uh, for all of those who don't know me, uh, my name is Philip Tomsig. I'm the vice chair of the technical steering committee at Risk Five International, and I'm the chief technologist at Roll, which is a, an engineering company working to develop standards to enable them to build software ecosystems. So. I'm deeply founded in software on the interface with the architecture and the microarchitecture. Risk five is is quite amazing when you're trying to target a um, new space like AIML accelerators, because it gives us a unique approach to silicon design, to custom silicon design and ISA design. So you've heard all the talks today. Uh, we have the ability to share a huge set of commonality, compilers, even profiles that can be targeted by compilers, individual extensions which are mix and choose if you are going for a specific market, and we have one unified ecosystem among that so that we aren't alone, we're really developing together. But Risk Five, unlike many other commercial ecosystems, allows us to freely add domain-specific acceleration. And I had that example to a room of um, AI adopters, AI practitioners, just a few weeks ago. If you have x86, you have the freedom to choose between AMD and Intel. If you have ARM, you have the freedom to either choose a ready-made core or get an architecture license, but you can't really freely add domain-specific acceleration. With Risk Five, you have all the freedoms and you can do whatever fits your specific application space. And that's really where Risk Five is fully coming to shine. So we have this flexibility to customize. We can add specific extensions. We can have different matrix extensions. Uh, we can optimize a core to be great for transformers, great for CNNs, spiking neural networks, and really target each one of these markets while providing an interoperable base environment. So if you're developing your own AI accelerator based on RISC-V today, uh, you start with a RISC-V core. That's easy. That's immediately out of the box targeted by your compilers. There's Linux available. And then you start adding your custom extensions. We have these layers of different dynamic detection of plugin mechanisms of software layers in order to put them on top and really retarget or optimize our software ecosystem while remaining interoperable with the base binaries, with the base environment, so that your development tools, observability, performance monitoring, are there out of the box at the time you start your design, really. And finally, you should never underestimate the power of domain-specific acceleration, of this ability to customize. Over the last year, I've seen vendors doing the sign and cosine instructions, partially hardware accelerated, uh, extensions on the metric side, multiple of them. So there's five to 10 companies out there that have already worked on, on their own matrix units for AI. And that is just really a, a small frame and a small set of what's out there. Because software is really defining where we're heading, software is defining what an application needs, and that can best be achieved by adding your software supporting acceleration and instructions to the base instruction set. And all of that is done in the framing of Risk Five. So there's no other ecosystem, there is no other architecture that really thrives on, on collaborative engineering and on collaborative innovation. Because what all these past silos, all of these established architectures have, is they have closed innovation. 
we will never know why certain instructions have or certain trade-offs have been made around instructions unless we've been there for the design story. RISC-V is doing this openly. So there is no hiding why we do that. I'm deeply involved in the attached matrix extension uh, standardization. And a big part of the story is really everybody coming to the table, bringing their applications, not just in AI ML, but DSP applications, high performance applications, and discussing openly what these applications need, what the requirements of each of the application domains are. And then we can make the right or take the right decisions at that time based on that information. So the trade-offs are publicly known and we don't fall into these little silos. So we are really pooling our resources. And as one market differs from another, we can also have these moments of thinking globally, understanding what the overall solution space is, while taking our decisions and making our trade-offs locally. So let me change the, the tempo of this presentation a bit. So you're all RISC-V interested, so the first part was pretty much preaching to the choir. But RISC-V is very quickly becoming the de facto standard for building AI accelerators. Uh, so yes, NVIDIA has their own instruction set and their entirely closed stack. Um, the latest official offering from Microsoft is built on an ARM solution, but we have a lot of adopters, and there will be more in a minute, that have reported that they are building their accelerators on RISC-V. So the big names, Meta, the Tensor Accelerator, the, the, the training, the, the Meta Training and Inference Acceleration Unit is built on RISC-V at seven nanometers at TSMC. Stream Computing, uh, a company I'm, I'm well familiar with because I've, I've just visited their headquarters a few weeks ago, uh, reported that they have a solution that competes with an A10 taped out already or shipping since 2022, um, done completely on RISC-V with their own matrix unit. And finally, Google just unveiled a couple weeks ago that their next generation Tensor Accelerator, their Tensor Processing Unit, is really a RISC-V core from Sci-5, coupled with an uh, in-house developed matrix extension that is connected to that core. But those are just three big applications that are well known in different parts of the world. But if you look outside at the, the list of sponsors we have, this pretty much le reads like the list of logos I have here. Uh, and I've pretty certainly forgot some of our adopters. So we have Meta, we have Stream Computing, we have Google. They all are adopting, but we are also having Esperanto. They have their many core systems targeted at AI, built on RISC-V. We have Revos, they just closed a major funding ground basically disclosing that they were building AI accelerators built on RISC-V with white matrix and tensor units. Softgo is another Chinese uh, entrant that many of us know from the Milk V board from their 64-bit core systems. Uh, they are building AI solutions. Ventana has disclosed or is, is marketing their solutions to the AI market as well. So at this point, we can really see that everybody who is entering the market and wants to build an AI-focused solution is really either evaluating RISC-V or building a solution based on it for all of the reasons we, we had discussed previously. So why is that? And that's really a purely economical question because RISC-V is completely changing the economics of building an AI accelerator. You have, and these are just random numbers. It could be 1%, it could be 5%, it could be 0%, but you have a huge percentage that you can just pick out of our standard landscape. You have the entire basic ISA. You can build, pick things out of the RISC-V ecosystem from open source cores, closed cores. You pick the basic compiler support with LLVM, with GCC out of the ecosystem, and then you add your 
vendor-defined extensions. These magic one to five to 10% of extra in order to build a 100% customized RISC-V EM uh, ML optimized product solution. So this is just about having this huge chunk of things to build on, this, this, this ability to stand on the shoulders of giants and get to a solution very quickly, uh, in very short time frequently, tape that out and ship an AI solution. Now AI is, is, is quite different. Um, we've, we've heard from Costa before, we are discussing very heavily on the standards track whether this is an ISA problem, this is an API problem, this is somewhere in between. It's certainly different from classic ISA definition. Uh, in one of the AME meetings, one of the participants even pointedly asked, why are we even defining the ISA? Shouldn't we just define an, an application layer in between? and the library functions that need to be provided. Because AIML is very heavily software-defined. So unlike other environments, you are not seeing anybody write the AIML solution in a low-level language or in assembly. Actually, I got very good laughs at AI Summit when I said, have you ever seen somebody write the AI, the AI solution in, a, in assembly? Uh, and doing a quick poll, nobody in the room even remembered assembly language. So we're building these on frameworks. This is the model. How does the processing pipeline look? The weights it's being trained in. The algorithms are rapidly evolving. So transformers, which are the basis of large language models today, of ChatGPT, they have first been published in 2017. So we're looking at seven years from first publication of an algorithm to having this in, in broad, wide usage. And at the same time, there's a huge differentiation opportunity if you look at the hardware stack underneath, microarchitecture, memory bandwidth. All of those are topics in order to get that out. So software is defining it. You're dealing very much in the abstractions and in things being pushed out. In video solutions, you never really see a binary shipping. You're having this chittable code or the framework that gets compiled by the driver stack. And that, of course, gives us the ability to have a whole load of innovation from the bottom up uh, in hidden behind the standardization, behind the abstractions. So where does that leave us at RISC-V? RISC-V really today is a tale of two standards. So we're having the classic, the conservative standardization path with IME. IME is the integrated matrix extension. It has two main goals. The first one is to compose clearly, compose friendly with the existing vector extension. The existing vector extension provides a specific register set, architectural, and well-established and field-proven architectural implementations. And you're adding the matrix layer on top of it. Reuse what's there, and you get a um, pretty decent speed up and performance level. There have been proprietary similar extensions already defined. And then we're trying to leapfrog that by having the attached matrix extension, which has an entirely different approach. We can do that. We can have two different standards because for AI ML, it doesn't matter that much. We can always add our software abstraction on top. And AME is a very different beast. So it's self-contained. It doesn't refer back to the RISC-V vector extensions. It is doing its own thing with only one goal, to have the highest performance and the smallest footprint for any specific market. So you can scale it down all the way to IoT, where you might just want to have a little bit of processing specialized on mattresses, but don't need the full power of RISC-V vectors. Or you have a high performance implementation where you want an implementation that is significantly more powerful than what you can get on the vector processing resources. It's really the path to the future 
on that side if you are looking for something that doesn't have to be compatible. So you may have the additional implementation burden of having both vectors plus AME, or you're just going the, the pure play path if, if you're going there. So those two standards can coexist, though. And the idea on this is very simple. We want to address all potential market segments in RISC-V. EIML is pervasive. It's in your automotive applications. It's in your embedded applications, smart speakers, mobile, high-performance computing. And that means that we need to provide as much of that flexibility to implement this today as we can so they can target this. So again, it's about providing as much commonality and allowing implementers to add their, their differentiator with as little effort as possible. And with this, we, we really have the choice for implementers. We have a path to provide both metrics and tensors on top of the same implementation space and specification space. And of course, we keep that promise of one unified enablement by lifting the abstraction layer up and having one common enablement path on the LVM, ML, LLVM, MLIR, and the key application libraries. And let me close this with the very aggressive standards development timeline. So it took us something like six years to get vectors from the start of the specification to ratification. EIML is faster. EIML has a huge push. So RISC-V really started out by making this an official specification effort end of last year. That didn't mean that people already didn't already have their solutions. But we started with the groups. We have them in progress. Their specification work going on today. The goal is to have some sort of functional specification end of the year, early in the next year, so we can actually aim for a freeze end of next year. This doesn't guarantee us that we achieve this timeline, but we have our entire ecosystem really unified behind that. And with those thoughts, let me conclude and invite you to a panel on AI, on the aspects of AI, and see what our various implementers and speakers and panelists have to say on that. Thank you. Thank you.